questions, please. Okay, cool. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Ebel. I'm a, an assistant professor at Idaho State University in Pocatello, Idaho. Um, I'm a cultural anthropologist, so um, I study in the environment, so I'm an environmental anthropologist. Um, I've been working on and off in Chile uh, for 13 years uh, prior to research as a volunteer at a, several organizations and then uh, research since 2014 with my doctoral degree. Um, my Fulbright project is entitled how women reclaim their marine and cultural commons, I'll explain that, um, political economy and commoning in Chile. Um, so this work is gonna take place in Los Lagos or the lakes region of Chile. Um, if you're not familiar, which I know most of you are, but Los Lagos is uh, Southern Chile, not super far South in my opinion, but still far South compared to Santiago. Um, and most of this work will take place in the island of Chiloé with some work on the mainland in Carl Mapu, which is near Mayujin, or La Comuna de Mayujin. Um, and again, I've been on and off in this region since 2010, uh, mostly because I met some wonderful Chilean, a Chilean family who is from Estaquia, which is right here. Um, and they're kind of like family to me now, so I just continued my work there. Um, so that's Google Maps version of Los Lagos. Um, but my former master student drew this map. She's a great artist. Um, and she actually drew this for my other students' work, but uh, they spent, I had two master students who spent some time here in the past couple of years, um, just when Chile opened its borders again after COVID. And so she drew this, and I wasn't with them until last November because I was very pregnant during that time actually when they were here. Um, and so couldn't travel with them the first time. But she drew this map, and I think it's a really good representation of Los Lagos. Um, because Los Lagos, we th or I, th I think it seems like Chileans think of the South as very, it's rural, um, it's, uh, a lot of people depend on subsistence harvesting, um, but there's also really large economic changes that have occurred in the South since the early 2000s, which include aquaculture. And so really large uh, salmoneras, really large uh, salmon aquaculture. Um, but this kind of shows that there is large aquaculture. There are also divers who dive for benthic resources like octopus and clams, loco, which is a false abalone. Um, and there are still people who have a lot of sheep. And so it's kind of showing this, uh, there's a tension and also kind of, that's what I'm looking for, like, uh, I can't remember the word, but cooperation between um, modernity, which we can think of modernity as aquaculture, you know, global industry, and also um, rural subsistence and farming and um, fishing that has, has been there for many generations. And so there's this kind of, tension sometimes between those groups, but also dependence between them as well. And so many of the divers I've worked with over the years, their children were now work on aquaculture farms as divers or other you know, security officers and things. Um, and so while there, as I'll show in a second, there are issues associated with aquaculture for some people in this region, there's a really um, close tie between those groups. And it's not very easy to um, say one thing's good or bad or um, so. This region is also um, something like 33% of this region lives under the poverty line um, for Chile, and 29% uh, of this region is indigenous. Um, so it looks different than the region we're in right now. Um, and yeah, I just thought, I just love this map that she drew. It's really awesome. So, so again, like I said, this region's experiencing economic change and it's also experiencing climate change or environmental changes. Um, I'm sure all of you remember in 2016, there was a large red tide in Southern Chile um, that caused the mortality of many different marine species um, and people were out of work. Both, uh, there's a moratorium on salmon fishing or excuse me, salmon farming and there was uh, no regular, or not regular, sorry, call it because they're regular because that's what I do, but uh, wild resource harvesting for up to six months in this region. And so people were out of work. There's already a lot of poverty in this region and people were struggling with uh, food security, among other things. But this is a picture from National Geographic at that time. What's interesting, it didn't really hit United States news, <coughs> except in National Geographic, um, but it was in global news, it was in the BBC. <coughs> and so this is 2022, a picture that my friend sent me who works on an aquaculture farm. Um, and so they're continuing to have these things, um, Maria Rojas or red tides. Um, and it's, sorry, <clears throat> a combination of um, warming water temperatures, um, high levels of chlorophyll, which causes triggers red tides, um, and also 
pollution from aquaculture farms. And so there are some good reports by Chilean scholars about this. Oh, thank you, <laughs> um, that you can read. Um, so we can think of climate change as what's, what is considered a threat multiplier. And so it's not always the singular cause of something, but it multiplies existing threats. And so although aquaculture is really important for this region, it can be considered a threat at certain scales because of the pollution from the fish. And I do know Chile is working, and the companies are working on cleaning that up. And so again, there's a lot of work being done on that. But climate change combined with this type of industry we see it around the world is, is triggering different problems. Um, and so there are many great oceanographers in Chile who are working on this from an oceanography perspective, ecologists, um, and I'm looking at it from the human side. Uh, so I worked with a climate scientist who's at the University of Maine where I did my doctoral research. And we use NASA data to look at over time um, what these changes might look like in terms of ocean sea surface temperature as well as chlorophyll. And so again, I'm not a biophysical scientist, but um, if you see here in pink, this is where divers harvest. They're called um, arias de manejo in Spanish or turfs in English, which are territorial use rights in fisheries. It's a form of management that Chile uses for inshore fisheries. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but what we see, you know, this is just a short span, but in 2006, um, you know, what you want to look at is anomalies. So the change or like long-term, change against long-term mean. Um, and there are very few sea surface temperature anomalies in 2006, low chlorophyll. Anything that's really red is a problem or could be a problem. Um, and then in 2016, what, when the red tide occurred, we see sea surface temperature anomalies, so really high water temperatures, um, as well as high chlorophyll. And so it just triggered that massive red tide. And so what I've been doing since then is looking at human adaptation. So how do people adapt their livelihoods? And that actually transitioned to how people adapt their governance. And so governance, we can think of governance from, from a diplomacy perspective or governance of, of natural resources and marine resources. And that's how institutions interact with each other to manage and govern resources. Um, and out of governance comes institutions that do the actual management like these kind of areas. So um, I just like this quote, it's from a Ben Orloff paper, but it's thinking about being in spheres of perception. How do we perceive environmental change and economic change and how do we start acting on it? Um, my student took this picture of me. I took her to see penguins because she wouldn't have gone by herself. You gotta see penguins, right? <laughs> um, so, but, so that's where I've been centering my research now instead of just studying what has happened and how have people responded um, kind of more into the realm of how, um, what can we actually do now and how can I as a scholar be involved if I can with my expertise in that process. Um, so the overarching question of my research more generally, which I think is important to where I went with my Fulbright, is how can we create just and equitable governance transitions in the face of global change? And so um, I think this piece is really important, just and equitable, and that matches um, the new administration in Chile as well. And you can actually see those changes happening um, when you look at governance of natural resources in Chile. Um, so just very briefly in the past, this is important for what I'm doing now, but I've studied formal governance. That includes institutions that are um, recognized by the government, you know, nonprofit organizations, RSA Maneco, uh, those types of things. And so Chile has transitioned from those territorial areas to that were once run by fishing unions um, to having these things called management committees after an amendment in I think it was 2012 or 2013, um, which includes more groups. And so, as many of you know, indigenous peoples didn't have um, a lot of power af uh, during, at any power during Pinochet and then after for a while. And so now indigenous communities can form their own institutions and they're involved in management committees. Um, and so it brings together what we call collaborative governance or um, polycentric governance is actually what's called in theory, but to manage these resources. Um, and it's been really interesting to see how those management committees form and um, what, you know, what are the social reasons or the cultural reasons how those groups can form and why they form in some places and why they don't in others. And so that's what I've been doing for, I don't know, like seven years now. But just for very briefly, we know that these groups form in Chile and when they're successful because of social capital that they have. And so that's if a fishing union leader knows someone at uh, Serena Pesca or knows someone at a university, they're much more likely to form an institution, a formal institution, than someone who doesn't or a group that doesn't. Um, in Los Lagos, 
I found like in Ancud, there people have the similar vision for their future, uh, whereas in other small communities on the mainland, they don't necessarily have that same future. And as an anthropologist, I think that can be tied back to, you know, histories of cooperation in Chiloé that go back millennia, basically, because of their harsh environment. And some of the mainland communities formed, or these fishing unions formed, um, after Pinochet's era because they had to, and, and that, will ca that can cause issues with collective action and cooperation. Um, and so there's cultures of cooperation in, in successful areas and sometimes not as much in others or indigenous versus non-indigenous conflict and things like that that I found. Um, and things that limit transitions is how people legitimize belonging to space. And so in Karamapu, actually, indigenous people there's so much involved in this, but indigenous people obviously legitimate, legitimize their belonging to space and now have the power to do that under a law from 2009 that allows them to create um, what's called ECMPOs in Spanish, but um, original, uh, what's it called? They're basically indigenous protected areas, marine protected areas. Um, and so that um, law that supports them to do that has caused conflict with fishing unions that are not indigenous, <coughs> et cetera. And so that creates divergent visions for how people want to adapt and change their governance structures. Um, and then people fear losing power and governance because of these new laws that are popping up. <clears throat> okay, so that all being said, that's things I've done in the past, but this leaves out a large group of people. Um, I'm talking about mostly men so far, and it's I've left out women. Um, but it's interesting because I've seen women, right? You see women, obviously, everywhere. But I've seen women processing seafood. <laughs> I've seen women as divers, but they're not involved in formal governance structures. Um, now you see indigenous community leaders that are women, um, but it's, you, you don't see them as, at, at least visibly, involved in these <coughs> governance structures. So um, for my Fulbright, I don't know what's <coughs> suggestion, allergies. For my Fulbright project, I'm looking at women <coughs> in the commons. And so the commons is, well, the commons can be defined as several things, but this definition of the commons involves natural resources. And so something that it's hard to exclude people and it's because um, everyone has access to it and it can be you know, challenging to manage. But women are involved in management, but they're involved in very sometimes invisible ways. Um, and so I was interested in how women are involved in informal governance and how women work to reclaim their spaces from men sometimes, but also from aquaculture companies and global industry. Uh, and so this is a picture of my friend, but my student took the picture um, and her, her child. Now she has two kids, actually. Um, and so my Fulbright research is, is going to examine this, which I'll show you in a second. But I'll be working uh, with the Instituto de Antropología at uh, La Universidad Austral de Chile um, for teaching and research. And so I'm going to be working, co-teaching, thankfully. I do speak Spanish, but I worry about my Spanish with teaching. Um, for the Anthropology of Development, which is a graduate course and then um, economic anthropology as an undergraduate course. And I'm really excited to teach anthropology of development because I actually haven't taught that before and I've always wanted to. We don't have the desire for that really at Idaho State, but I'm trying to develop it. <laughs> um, and I have taught economic anthropology and English at my university. But um, So I'll be co-teaching with Gonzalo Saavedra, um, and he's a professor in the department. <clears throat> so for the research side of things, uh, this is my research question for the Fulbright. And so how do women enact commoning, and I'll explain that in a second, to reclaim the physical marine commons as well as their culture from global industry. So women are really involved uh, along the coast in seaweed harvesting, as you see here. This is one of my master's students. And this is this um, Antonio, the student that I was talking about, actually, the high school student who wants to go to college, and she doesn't know how to do that. And so she asked me, and I was like, but what Antonio told me is very helpful. Um, and so uh, women are very involved in seaweed harvesting, as there are around much of the world, actually. Um, and they're involved in what we consider conservation of seaweed too. So how they harvest seaweed matters. Um, and they know ways to harvest seaweed that can contribute to the conservation of seaweed. Um, and they know different types. There are like three or four different types of seaweed just in this picture that to us doesn't look like it, but there actually are. And so they know which kind to harvest at what time of the year and um, things like that. So I'm going to be working with women um, to study what's called commoning. And that's the definition of commoning. But basically commoning is kind of this invisible, pro it's not necessarily invisible, but we see it as invisible because it's not formalized. Um, but it's this process between humans and non-humans, so a multi-species process of how individuals interact 
and draw upon their social relations or their social practices or cultural practices to do something. And I know that sounds vague, but it means, so how do women common or draw upon their social practices and their social relationships to create something like conservation or informal governance of a resource or a lot of people have studied urban commoning where um, people common to create gardens in cities or public spaces. Um, there's a lot like that. And so commoning um, is applied to any commons, which is not necessarily a public space, but um, something that people use and um, is open. But then you start creating ways that people take, usually hopefully take care of it. And so I'm using this theoretical idea of commoning to understand how women do this in what we consider kind of invisible or less visible pathways. Um, and so it could be that they're commoning for, you know, taking care of seaweed. I'm not sure yet because I haven't studied it. Or it could be that they are commoning and they're creating, you know, they're creating, um, English word for that, but like mercados that are informal. Um, and they are selling things as women entrepreneurs, for example, and local places as tourists come to these areas. What's interesting is that I, this is an Estaquia. I went to Estaquia in 2010. There wasn't a paved road. It took hours to get there by bus from Puerto Montt. And now there is a paved road and you can drive there and the bus is much shorter. <laughs> and, um, and so as globalization comes to these places, you know, what are women doing to kind of ensure their, or decrease their vulnerability and ensure their their spaces without losing those spaces to things like globalization. And um, so that's the theoretical process or the idea at least. And so again, I've been here for a little while, but for the Fulbright, I'll be working with women. It's called participant observation in anthropology where I go out and see, like harvest seaweed. I work with them on, I actually can't eat bread, unfortunately, but baking bread. I know Chileans love bread. I have celiac disease, so I can't eat it. Um, things like that. And then I'll be conducting interviews with them. Um, but I found over many years now that interviews are really helpful, but actually participant observation is one of the best ways, particularly to understand commoning, because these things happen in less visible ways. If you're living with them and working with them, that is the commoning process. Um, and so that is going to be a kind of the main mode of doing that. Um, what's been really interesting is my students have used different methods to, uh, in anthropology. And one of my past students who was in that picture, this is another student of mine, actually, um, but she was, she did poetry. And so she was doing participant observation and, and she wrote, she's a great poet, wrote poetry and took pictures and wrote an ethnography. Um, and she was looking at women's well-being, how globalization has impacted women. And what she's found is that um, women in rural Chile, which maybe isn't surprising in most of the world, didn't have a lot of autonomy or agency. And so with the influx of global industry like aquaculture, women now work in those spaces. Um, but then it makes it hard. It can make it harder to have families because they're traveling a lot to work on aquaculture farms. And um, but then older women are also staying in their communities. And it's just interesting to see generational differences between women in these spaces. And she, so my student was the one who she came to me and said, "What do you think is an interesting thing?" And I said, "I think studying women would be fascinating." And I've never done it, you know. And so she started it. So we have some preliminary data, which is good. Um, and so I'm continuing on a different theoretical perspective of of some of the stuff we started. Um, these are just a couple of pictures of women. So women are involved in diving and they're involved in fish processing and catching fish. Um, but again, it's less visible and not necessarily formally recognized. Uh, yeah, I don't know how long that was, but that's it. <laughs>